Good evening, my friends. How are you? Glad you're all here tonight. Checking the audio. How is the audio here? Somebody give me a thumbs up or give me something up. Let's, uh... Making sure that my chat is doing good here. Looks like we have about 17 people on the line already. John Williams is in the house. John Williams from the Harrisburg area of Pennsylvania. Tim Powers, good to see you, sir. Happy to have you here tonight. Ashland, Kentucky here, that's Tony. Yeah, excellent. Uh, Gabriel, excellent. L from Utah, how are you? Good to see you. Public servant there, fireman. A little shout out to Fireman Sweden in the house tonight. That's great. That's really good. Flint, Michigan. Jerry is here. Good to have you. Toronto in the house tonight. Ivy Lewis, you're new. Thank you. Good to have you here. John Galdari, Northern New Jersey loves you. Well, we love Northern New Jersey. Atlanta is here. San Francisco, North Carolina, Victoria, British Columbia. New listener from New Jersey, Ivy Lewis. Great, thank you. Thank you for being around. That's good. Boynton Beach, Winnipeg, Calgary, Spokane, Washington. Boston, Massachusetts. A lot of people in the house tonight. Wow, nice representation. Nice representation. Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, East Tennessee, Hartford, Connecticut. Get uh, AMS. I would love to get AMS on here. I think he would be good. Chicago, Finland, Australia, down under tonight. So we have an international crowd here. Hartford, Connecticut. We're going to wait till we have uh, a critical mass of people here. We did this, what, about a week ago? Georgia, South Carolina, Chad. We are here because you're awesome, man. And I'm here because you are awesome, man. Guiana, wonderful. I have a, a good friend from Guiana. Owns a restaurant. Chicago is in the house. This is part two tonight. Nicholas is here. This is great working night and also suffering from a breakup. Yes. You know, it's uh, Dartmouth, Massachusetts. Guatemalan coffee and chopsticks ready to go. All right. Got the chopsticks going. A lot of people do suffer. Boston, Bombay, New York. Bombay, New York. <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, hello back there to you. That's wonderful. Uh, Salamanlakam. Yes. Yes. And also with you, Brazil, St. Petersburg, Colorado in the house tonight. I'm actually on my phone, so this is actually doing pretty good. I hope I don't go out of focus here. Out being active tonight, my best everybody into you, George. Excellent. Thanks, Tad. Thanks for the beard vids. Fantastic. That's good. I'm glad you like it. Going through a divorce. Yeah, South Dakota is in the house. We're not talking about uh, anything uh, about women's rights or, or anything like that. We're not doing that. We're going to be going live in a little bit here, and I'm going to be talking about Tampa, Florida. Pain meds and self-administered IV and a love for the salt. In. There we go. Oh, that's funny. That's good. Broken heart, yes. Minnesota. I'm not in the King of Prussia mall. I haven't been in the damn mall in two years. Text from the 21 convention. It's a good friend of mine. Hello, old man. Well, hello, young man or young woman. I don't know, but that's okay. Modesto, California is here. Well, we will get started right now. Uh, this is part two of 50 things that you will feel after breakup. Stockton, California is in the house. 
50 things that you're going to feel after a breakup or a divorce and what you can do about it. We did part one a little over a week ago, Golden, Colorado. I don't drink coffee at night. No. I don't drink coffee after 11 or 12. Philadelphia, PA, Long Island, New York is in the house. I had a nice day at the salon, came home, took a nap. Katie from Washington State. Yeah, we're not talking about uh, MGTOW, we're not talking about Red Pill, we're not talking about Manosphere, we're not talking about anything like that, as you know. I like to say that the first rule of Red Pill and Manosphere and all that stuff is you don't talk about those things at all. It's something that you are, it's not something that, uh, that we just constantly talk about. You'll see in the background, in the back here, I have rule number one, First, do no harm. When you go through a breakup or a divorce, do no harm to yourself because there are people that are programmed to self-destruct when they encounter obstacles. Going through a breakup or a divorce is an obstacle. Your life isn't going, ah, let's get this party started. John Williams with a super chat. Kuwait is in the house tonight. That's awesome. The day is going fantastic. So... Uh, let's see. I look like I could use a nice uh, Tacbec Especial. I don't even know what that is. But I'll take your word for it. <laughs> Hit that like button. <laughs> Absolutely. So here, here's the thing that we want to talk about. Some people are wired to self-destruct when they hit obstacles. And one of the... Th like, for instance, there's people that get bad news, and what do they do? They reach for the Southern Comfort. That's the first thing they do. And they finish it. They drink half of it one day, the other half the next day. I sip a little bit at a time. If you're enjoying a distilled spirit tonight, then let me just toast you first before we do anything. A lot of people will self-destruct when they encounter obstacles, when they ha when they encounter hard times. And I don't know why that is. I really think it's a, a lack of tools. When you don't have the tools to cope, to create solutions for yourself, when, you when you're at an intersection and don't know which way to go, the easiest thing to do is tip a bottle up, hit the vape pen, pop a pill, you know, wash it down with a beer. And let me turn off this uh, heater. Hold on one second. There we go. I feel like I'm sitting at an airport with the noise from that fan. <laughs> what we want is, that's called self-medication. And a lot of people medicate their pain to try to take them away. Obviously, having alcohol and drugs takes you away. There are other drugs, quote unquote, drugs. Another drug when you go through a breakup is other people. Sex can be a drug. It can be something that we go through. Um, we end up inviting people into our life to change the way we feel. So even a seven second orgasm can be a drug. So we seek out pe people to do that. And we end up going through a lot of people. That's why a lot of people uh, have a revolving door when they go through breakups and divorce. And what I'm not gonna do is tell you to not do that because that's what I did. 15 years ago. I did say that I didn't touch alcohol during the first year after my divorce. So the, and I remained uh, sober um, and I don't have an alcohol problem. I don't have a drug problem, but I can see where going through a breakup or divorce or that kind of pain or overeating or an overindulgence in something can lead to excessive use and excessive behaviors. 
So uh, we're not talking about red pill. We're not talking about uh, MGTOW at all. That's that's a whole nother discussion. That's a whole nother channel. We don't do that. The first rule of red pill is you don't talk about the red pill. You live the red pill. You don't talk about it. And I will bring a voice of balance to the manosphere uh, as a result of that and will uh, drive some people away. That's okay. Um, I, do, I certainly don't mind that. I want people who are rational in their thinking and rational in their responses to pain. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Okay, so save your other questions for another time. <coughs> 50 things that you will feel after a breakup and what you can do about it. We went through the first uh, 10 or 11 last time. This time we're going to talk about a few more. Lack of motivation. Lack of motivation. You don't want to get to the gym. You don't want to iron your clothes. You don't want to uh, you take shortcuts. You pay less attention to yourself and you're motivated. Um, you're not motivated to do those things. And that's very hard for a lot of people to to be able to, like they say, the signs of clinical depression are uh, a loss of interest in things that you used to be interested in. And I'm not a, I'm not one, I'm not a mental health professional anymore. I used to be. And I don't want to talk about mental health issues. I don't think that this is the place for it. I want to give you practical tools. Because I believe a lot of times what people call depression truly is discouragement. Uh, whereas depression, the answer is different types of therapy and possible medications. But discouragement, the answer for discouragement is what? Somebody answer. What is the answer? What is the solution for discouragement? I'm looking for one word. What is it? Who knows? The answer for discouragement, think about the word discouragement. The answer is courage. Courage. Think about it. When you are going through a dark time in your life, there is a a feeling where you don't have the courage to face the day. The simplest thing, the simplest tasks seem hard. Ask anyone who's there. Some of you are there right now. Some of you have been through it years ago. Some of you are a week into it, a day into it, a month into it, a year into it, into that type of discouragement. And it's hard to get up in the morning and get a good shave or groom yourself or make yourself look good and put creases in your clothing. I iron my clothes every day. So for me, if I'm not ironing, then you know there's something wrong. You need to have the courage to face the day. That's absolute key. Courage to face the day. And these are, these are tools that I'm giving you tonight to deal with that lack of courage. We end up taking shortcuts when we don't, for instance, when you have no words or can't, or it's like people that are just always like that far away from fighting and making a clenched fist. They can't reason with you, so they want to fight all the time. And when you look at the various channels, these men's channels, everyone wants to fight. No fighting. You just went through a bunch of fighting. You just went through a bunch of shit. You just got hurt. Don't be a heartbroken heartbreaker. Don't cause more pain in, in life because you experienced pain. Remember in the movie um, Platoon, where in the, in the beginning, the commander was saying to the one guy that got shot, he said, take the pain, take the pain, take the pain. That's what I'll say to you. Take the pain. Deal with it. Don't drown it. 
let me tell you something. Every time you drink yourself to sleep, every time you vape yourself to sleep, every time that you screw somebody in your bed or their bed, you're feeling good for a, a short period of time, but the reality is you're just postponing the pain and you steal and you still have to deal with that at a later date. So you can literally prolong your suffering. You know, they say pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. It's voluntary. Does divorce and breakup hurt? Yes, of course it does. Of course it does. How you deal with that can determine how long you suffer, how fast you're able to move on. Lack of motivation is one of the first things to go. It could be dishes in the sink, piled up. That was my thing. I wouldn't even put dishes in the dishwasher. Just junk piled up. I lost motivation to even clean the house when my marriage ended. I lost motivation to, uh, uh, to even take care of myself. And I put on weight. I think I shared with you last time, one of the things that happened to me was uh, food was a, a big drug for me, where I would order Domino's or Papa John's pizza and keep the front door open. And I'm sitting in my living room with a coffee table in front of me, and the guy would come to the front door, ring the doorbell. And I wouldn't even get up to go get the pizza and pay the guy. I said, come on in, like that. The guy brought the boxes of pizza. All right, go set it down right there. He puts it down, the two-liter Coke, the garlic knots, the chicken wings, all that stuff. And I was too lazy and didn't have the motivation to even get up didn't want to. And I could slam down half a pizza and a box of wings and garlic knots and drink a liter of Coke. And of course, it wasn't just Coke. There was rum in that Coke as well and a little squeeze of lime. So lack of motivation to even take care of yourself. So self-care disappears when you're going through pain. This, this chat will be saved. Number 13, going through the motions of everyday life. You know you have to go to work. If you have children, you still have to see them. You might be fighting for them, but it's very difficult to, to continue life as you know it because life as you know it ended. So now you got to create a new normal for yourself. Uh, that manifests itself in different things. All your senses are going to be affected by a breakup or divorce. Think about your think about your five senses. What you see, what you smell, what you taste, what you hear, and what you feel. All of those things. Divorce and breakup is a sensory experience. A sensory. All your senses feel divorce. And then there might be a sixth sense, which is our heart, that thing inside of us. So everything suffers. Let's talk about what we feel. How does that change? You're walking through the kitchen and your partner's in the kitchen making dinner or preparing something or they're there. You walk by, you just brush by their back, their bottom end a little bit and put your hand on their shoulder and give them a kiss. That's no longer there. There's no one to touch. You might smell perfume or hand lotion, or, or if there's a woman watching this right now, uh, a man's cologne, you no longer are smelling that. That changed. What you, what you see, there's an absence in the house or the apartment when that person is gone or when you go and get your own place. That's difficult. So now there's an emptiness there. Something is missing. Something is missing. I just need to keep going back to this right here. Rule number one, first, do no harm. First, do no harm to yourself. Secondly, remember what I taught last week. First, do no harm. Secondly, do only good for yourself. 
So maybe breakup and divorce is a good time to start working out and going to the gym. And then you know if you you'll know automatically if you're overdoing it. Most people, whenever a, a man sees a woman on a dating site and she's real thin, and she's newly separated or newly divorced, uh, she's probably anywhere between 10 and 50 pounds lighter than she usually is. Women pretty much starve themselves after a breakup. Now, men lose weight too, because you don't have motivation for eating, but women do it for different reasons. So I believe the genders do... Uh, I am I'm a firm of firm belief that the genders are different. I don't believe they're the same. Men grieve differently than women do. It's a reality. Men commit suicide five times more than women. It's a fact. Men are usually hit blindsided more than women are when it comes to divorce and breakup. Usually by the time a woman leaves, she has thought about it for months, maybe even years, and planned her getaway. And she also went on a honeymoon, like an anniversary weekend with you. I'm speaking to the men now. I'm not trying to uh, turn anyone off. And this is not a woman-hating session. It's not a, man, it's not a male supremacist session. This is not a MGTOW session or a anything like that. We're, we're not using that terminology. That glossary is out the door. We don't talk about that on Friday nights. Not on this channel. So what happens is your senses, everything. For instance, if you are in a relationship where your partner did a lot of cooking and you're no longer in that relationship, your sense of taste is even sensing the breakup. You're, t you're not tasting what they made anymore. You're not seeing them in your house anymore. You're not smelling them. You're not feeling them. The house is quiet. I had to deal with a quiet house, and that was really difficult. Now, of course, oh, thank you for the super chat. Thank you very much. The house is now quiet. Of course, now I am, you know, I am the stable stoic and I'm the guy that loves solitude. I love spending holidays by myself. I go hiking by myself on the holidays. Here it is a Friday night. Should I be out partying? Well, actually, it's still a work night for me because for me, Saturday night is the end of my, my Saturday night is like your Friday night because I work on Saturdays in the salon cutting hair. So I still try to get a decent night's sleep on Friday night. And then Saturday night, you would think I'm out just boogieing and dancing and just having a great old time and hanging out. I don't. My favorite night to go out is Sunday night. My favorite time to go out is Sunday night. That is not a real candle. That's a fake candle right there. It kind of, It looks real, but it's fake. It's one of those. It's got batteries in it. But it does look real, doesn't it? So I've, I learned how to appreciate silence. I learned how to appreciate solitude. I'm the guy that would go camping by myself, literally camping, go to a campsite by myself, string up a hammock and read my graphic novels and comics all day long, take a little hike in the afternoon, take a nap, That's what I did. But it took years to be able to appreciate my own company. Here I am. I'm outside in the Van Gogh room. This is a, a shed where I kind of created like a little man cave studio kind of thing where I do my broadcasts from and puff on a pipe and that type of thing and relax and read books. You can see back here. <laughs> see that right there? That's Ivan Throne's book, The Nine Laws. Up here is the best of Hemingway. I can just see them in the monitor here. So everything changes. Everything changes when you go through a breakup or divorce. Your senses feel the loss. It's not just a logistical thing. There's just it's not about a loss is not just about 
is not just about a, a, a human being leaving your life. It's about a sensory loss. You're feeling that loss in your body. If you're used to sleeping with one another, you, you know, I, I always, when I had a regular sleep partner, girlfriend after, you know, after I was married and then I had, you know, long-term girlfriends, I would just reach over in the middle of the night and just feel them, put my hand on their waist or their bottom end, whatever, and just kind of just put my hand there just to make sure they're there. And it was a, a comforting thing that men do. That was no longer there. So in the middle of the night, I would reach over and feel an empty bed. I wasn't hearing breathing. I had to get used to the silence. You know, when you're sleeping with someone on a regular basis, you you hear them breathing, and it's comforting. And you don't mind them. Like right now, if if I slept with someone right now, I'd have to get used to it all over again because I'm so used to sleeping by myself. And that's that's a weird thing, to have to get used to having someone around again. That's very strange. But you will get to that point if you're if you are in the middle of this right now. All right. So you're going through the motions of everyday life because you have to. That's the only thing that you that makes you feel normal is going through the motions of everyday life. Number 14, no desire to cook for yourself. It's easier to stop and go through a drive-through than it is to cook for yourself. And I think that's uh or we eat more fast food or easy, easy preparation food. We don't uh, take the time and enjoy cooking. Basically, when you are going through a breakup or a divorce, you pretty think about this. Think about this now. When you're going through a breakup or a divorce, you eat to live. Eating is something you know you have to do in order to live, but it's no longer something you enjoy. You don't get pleasure from it anymore. You eat because you know you have to. You, you eat because if you don't, you will die. So eating just becomes a very mechanical thing. I suppose I need to eat something. And you do. I suppose you look at your watch and you say, yeah, it's dinner time. I, I suppose I need to eat something. And you do. And you keep yourself just barely alive. You don't want to prepare anything exquisite. drive throughs are your best friend. McDonald's, Burger King, Chick-fil-A, Taco Bell. Number 15, there is a desire to escape. A desire to escape. And escaping can take the place of so many, uh, like, let's name the ways that you can escape. Tell me in the chat, what are ways that people escape from the harsh reality? Drugs, alcohol, vaping, eating going to the gym excessively, watching television, TV, alcohol, food, sex, yeah, cartoons, sure. Porn, absolutely. Gaming, isolating, shopping, vinyl records. There's so many things that people do to escape self-destructive behavior, that's true. Sleeping taking depression naps. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and I remember in the 70s when disco came out and you would dance all night. Places wouldn't open up till 10 or 11 o'clock, these clubs, and you would dance literally till 2 or 3 in the morning, 
But during the day, you would take a nap so you could stay awake all night. We used to call them disco naps. I always thought that was kind of funny. When I get together now, I'm taking a disco nap. That was kind of fun. So think about the ways that you escape. Identify those things. Commit them to paper. Write those things down. Identify the enemies in your life. Otherwise, they just keep keep trying to get in. Those coping mechanisms, those negative coping mechanisms are always knocking on the door all the time. And you need to learn how to have uh, positive coping behavior. Number 16, alcohol use. I'm sitting out here in the Van Gogh room. I've got a little shot glass here, the square shot glass. This is a square shot glass. I started drinking from square shot glasses when uh, when I had the big beard because I could put the corner of this in my mouth right here like that, and I wouldn't drink the alcohol through my mustache. I just, one of my clients gave me this right here. This is Angel's Envy Bourbon. And I have to say, I really like it. I did ride a motorcycle uh, when I was married and also at my divorce. Let me just put a little bit in there. Angel's Envy. I really do like this. So let's just, uh, here's to you. I'm just going to take a little sip right here. Lovely. Just absolutely lovely. Yeah. Alcohol use. Now, did you notice how much I put in the shot glass? You see that? What is that? Maybe a quarter of an inch in there? There's not a lot in there. Not even a half inch. I drink for taste, not for effect. And I learned that through my decision to not drink when I went through the divorce. And I think that just that alone taught me to be able to enjoy alcohol. Because prior to that, honest to God, I was, I was filling up glasses like this. Just like literally, not even mixed drinks. Just like this whole thing would be filled up right up to here. And I would drink it down to here and with one one raise of the glass, be like, dunk, 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 like that. And I would literally drink a rocks glass with two, two gulps. And that's sick. And the faster I felt it, the better. Because I wouldn't have to think about my pain. Let me take a little sip. Alcohol is easy to get. It's easy to get, and I think that um, that's the other thing, too, because you want to get from zero to 60 so fast. That's when people discover whiskey. That's when people discover vodka, because it's like jet fuel. You can get intoxicated real, real fast fast. So for the average person, drinking a glass, now there, I, I got these ice cube trays that make these two inch square ice cubes. They're monstrous ice cubes. And I put one ice cube in here, just one, to minimize the uh, dilution of the actual drink itself. But I would drink that much. So what's that about? Six, that, what is that? Maybe six ounces? six to eight ounces. After one of those, I was feeling kind of like, okay, yeah, feeling, you know. And then what would I do? I'd pour another one. And son of a gun. And then, of course, eat half of a pizza. It was the easiest way to escape. Absolutely easiest way to escape. 
Inability to concentrate, number 17. Inability to concentrate. You're sitting at your desk. If you're a writer, breakup or divorce always gives you writer's block. Always. Always. You can't, you're not creative anymore. You're unable to focus on things. Work on your car, anything that needs to be taken apart where it, like you, you're take you're disassembling something and you have like the pieces of it together. And then you have all those pieces on a desk or on a table or um and then you're like, oh crap, I gotta put it all back together. And you're unable to concentrate to remember what went where. Hey, thanks for the super chat. Appreciate that. Thank you. So we'll go through these things that I'll talk about what you can do about them. Number 18, what you feel when you're going through divorce or breakup is fear. Fear that you might not have a future. Fear of dying alone. When people go through breakups, you think like, oh my God, I could die. You actually feel like you could die and no one will find you. They will find your dead, deceased, rotten body sitting in a chair with the remote in your hand in front of the TV. And there's a temptation to feel so alone when you go through a breakup or divorce. And there was a song back in the 70s by England, Dan, and John Ford Coley called Nights Are Forever Without You. And it's, it's a good song. The lyrics are really, they describe exactly what someone goes through. And the issue is that a simple night, an eight-hour night, seems like 80 hours, and you just want the day to come. You just want the day to come. You want the sun to rise. It's difficult to go through. It's very, very hard. Fear. Fearing that you might not be attractive. Why did you go through the breakup? Why did you go through the divorce? Uh, is it something you can't fix? Is there something wrong with you? Are you defective? Maybe I'm defective. That's one of the first things you might feel. Maybe I'm defective. Maybe there's something wrong with me, which is a lot of people, one of the first things they do is they blame themselves. You know, everybody, I tell you that you're responsible for your own behavior, everything. Did you know the person that divorced you or broke up with you, they are responsible for their behavior. That just doesn't apply to you. So why do people start blaming themselves almost immediately after going through a breakup? It's my fault. It's all my fault. I did this wrong. I did that wrong. I gained too much weight. I was being an ass. I snapped on them too much. I cursed too much. I lost my temper too much. You know what? Everybody's got shit in their life. Everybody has maladaptive ways of dealing with things. It's not your fault. You might have contributed to some things, yes, because you have to, as Tex said, if you remember in my interview with Tex two days ago, I said, what advice would you, ha would you give to men? He said, own your shit. Powerful, isn't it? Powerful. Take ownership of your life, but don't blame yourself. No more blaming yourself for your divorce. No, they are responsible for their decision. It's on them. They got to live with the decision they made. For instance, let's just talk to the men for a minute. If your wife or girlfriend left you and you can't figure out why, this is, this is my statement to you, is that wherever she goes, she has to take herself with her. Don't think that she's starting over as a new person. She's just taking her to another location. 
And any man that comes into her life will be subject to the same exact things that you were. When it comes to ladies, the ladies that are on this call, if you have gone through a heartache, heartbreak, a divorce, that man is still doing the same shit to another woman that he did to you. Now, this is not the kind of channel where only one where one gender is right and one gender is wrong. Let's let's get real. There are a lot of channels that are just all about let's blame women, let's blame men. We don't do that here. Everyone has to own their shit. Everybody. Number 19. Increased web usage. Increased web usage. Usually that means social media. Rather than watching TV, we go on, because TV is just, it's dead. It's not dynamic. It might be something to veg out in front of, but the reality is you're not interacting with it. And since since divorce and breakup is a sensory experience that we talked about, you're looking to fill those senses with some type of stimulus. And social media is the perfect way to have stimulus, right? You can get almost immediate feedback for something that you post. You might do a selfie, okay, post it. Let's say you're going through a breakup or divorce. You don't know why, having a hard time. You decide, you know, you just want to do a selfie. You post it. Let's say you're a guy and you post a picture of yourself and some girl says, hey, handsome. You're like, whoa. Wow, that got my attention. And you think to yourself, wow, that's pretty cool. So you start doing more and getting more feedback like that. Now think about it. Social media is the first, for the first time in history, do we show ourselves to complete strangers and feel good about their feedback to us. Conversely, for the first time in history, social media is the first, for the first time in history, you can post something on social media and feel like crap for what a stranger says to you. I know when I first started my YouTube channel, people would say negative things to me, and I'm thinking like, I'm actually getting upset over what a stranger said. What the hell's the matter with me? I don't even know this person, but they ruined my morning or my day. Now I'm years beyond that. But you will have increased web usage when you go through a divorce or breakup. And one of the first things you'll do is you'll go to a dating site and you'll start swiping. And they are those that whole thing is relatively new. I'd say we've only had the swipe sites for about... Um, what, five years now, maybe five years. Prior to that, it, there was no swiping. It was you liked or hit a star or something like that. You actually had to do something and, you know, think for a second. Okay, now you can go through 20 people like this. No, 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 yes, no, no. No, no. Boom, a match. Oh, wow. Well, guess what? 50 other people just matched with that person too. So you go in the queue of those 50 people. And then they look at you. And they size you up. And you might get together with them. You might have a date. You might meet for coffee. You might meet for a drink. You might have sex in the car. You might end up back at their house. They might end up back at your house. All kinds of... There's a million different things that could happen. And then you stop hearing from them. And what do we call that? You're getting ghosted. And then all of a sudden that really hurts because it reminds you of being rejected in your breakup and divorce. And know this, that because of the swipe culture, you are always, I used to say, you are one mouse click away from being replaced. Think about this. You are one mouse click 
away from being replaced. Now it's even faster. You are one swipe away from being replaced. So who's next in line, the next available handsome guy, the next av available pretty girl? And who knows what people's motivation is when it comes to online dating? It, it's strange. It's created a whole new thing. I think most people meet that way nowadays. So there will be increased web usage. We're going to do 21. Uh, number 20, sloppiness. T21 Surfer. Thank you for the uh, super chat. That's awesome. Powerful. $14.99. Wow. Love it. Cool. Thank you very much. Yes, it is saving lives. It's Friday night, and there's people who are on this broadcast right now who are watching who are going through their very first breakup or a recent breakup. Some, it could have happened yesterday. Some, it could have happened today, a week ago, a month ago. So it's still fresh. So practical teaching like this can give you some relief. Sloppiness. I am one who, when I am emotionally down, I don't take the time to fold my clothes. They go on a doorknob. <laughs> they go on the bedpost. They go over the back of a chair at the end of the day. Day number two, doorknob, bedpost, back of the chair. Day number three, doorknob, bedpost, back of the chair. After a week, there's a whole week's worth of clothes hanging all over your room. You don't even know what is dirty and what is clean anymore because by the time you go to bed, you're not doing your routine. You know when you go through a breakup, your night routine just comes to an end, right? You just drop your clothes and you go to bed, hoping and praying that you will fall asleep fast. So there is a sloppiness. I talked about dishes in the sink. I, I had a dishwasher. I was too lazy to even load my dishwasher. Now, what the heck is up with that? That was difficult. So dishes piled up in the sink to the point where I'd open up the cabinet and I and there was no dish, there was no plates left in the cabinet. The drawer, my silverware drawer, there was no forks left. You know why? They were all in the sink and the counter and dirty and gnarly. And three days ago, chicken bones on the counter. And hard pizzas that, that feel like a Frisbee in the living room, in a box. You know that's happened to you. You know you've done that. It's difficult. It's hard. I know it is. I, I feel for you. I've been there. I know exactly what you're going through. But it's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the world. You are alive and you will survive. And 21, the last one, eyes are tired and strained. Yeah, you know, uh, you'll notice that when you go through a breakup or divorce, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you'll notice you look tired. Your eyes are strained. You have bags under your eyes. You see the stress. You might have more wrinkles. My ex-wife used to say if she doesn't get enough sleep that her face looks like a dish rag. I always thought that was funny face looked like a dish rag. And we wear our grief and exhaustion on our faces. We just don't feel it. We look it. So let's talk about what you can do about all these things. We're only going to be on the air tonight for an hour. No more than 60 minutes. So back to lack of motivation. Lack of motivation is this. Sometimes you need tools and little things to uh, prompts. So for lack of motivation, when it comes to activity, I find that exercise devices, like on my phone, I have a, uh, like a tracker, an exercise tracker, and I have it set to so many steps a day. And some people say, you know, if you're relying on a machine or a 
app to tell you how many steps you got in the day that you're already fucked. I don't believe it. Sometimes I think we need to be told what to do. When you're going through a breakup and a divorce, sometimes, like if I was working with somebody, literally working with somebody who was going through a breakup or divorce, you feel like you got to wind them up, point them in the right direction and push them. And I felt like I needed that. I wasn't a self-starter when I went through it. Now, now, think about this. This was like almost 20 years ago. I'm way beyond that now. I'm a different human being now. Overcome so much of that. So whatever tools you have, whatever tools you need to get your motivation back, whether it be alarm clocks, t- excuse me, timers, timers are good. Anything that that prompts you to move is important. Going through the motions of everyday life, you have to keep going through those motions of everyday life. Even though you f- just feel like you're going through the motions, realize that what you're doing is keeping you alive. It's giving you meaning. The simplest things like getting up, showering, shampooing yourself, grooming yourself, for ladies, putting your makeup on, getting yourself going, looking good. Don't don't let people don't let people guess that you're going through something by the way that you look. They don't need to look at you and say you must be going through something. I used to wear all that in my sleeve. I looked like I was having a hard time. Keep them guessing. No desire to cook for yourself. Rather than going through uh, a drive through which I said drive throughs are your best friend, what I'd like to see you do is make food for yourself. Make things. Uh, make a large pan of lasagna. Bake the whole pan of lasagna like you're cooking for an army. And then when it's done... Cut it up and portion it and put it in plastic containers and put it in the freezer or in the fridge so you can grab and go. You wouldn't normally do that. You would just go through a drive through and eat junk. Still cook. If you can, still cook like you're cooking for a family. That's real important. Alcohol use. I made a decision to not touch alcohol during the first year in order to take the pain to feel it because I didn't want to prolong it anymore. So if you have to, if you're unable to control your drinking, like for instance, like, you know, here, here I am, look at this. All right. This is, this is my alcohol for the night right here. And, (laughs) and This is still some Southern comfort that was left from a day ago. That's kind of funny. I just threw an ice cube in it. But I I am a um, a rational person. I don't I don't have alcohol does not run my life. I enjoy the taste of it. I don't enjoy the effect of it. Think about that. Better yet, don't drink at all. And that's what I chose to not do after my breakup, after my divorce. Chose not to drink at all. Not even touch alcohol. Didn't even touch it. To the point, think about this. I went to my brother's wedding. Robert, thank you, sir. Do something physical for your health every day, hour by hour, day by day. Yes, sir. Robert, thank you. And thank you for that super chat. And that's a great comment right there. Hour by hour. Even if you have to set a timer for an hour and do your best, do no harm, do no harm for an hour. How's that? Can you do no harm to yourself for an hour and do only good? I remember at my brother's wedding, I will never forget, I was uh, probably six months into my divorce, And at my brother's wedding, I didn't even toast with champagne. I toasted with water when everyone, you know, raises their, when everybody raises their glass up to toast the the couple. I toasted with water. 
I couldn't think of a I couldn't think of a better reason to to drink than being divorced. What a great reason to drink. What a great reason to lose yourself. But I wasn't going to do it. I committed to that. And it's not like the day after the one year of not drinking that I went out and got blasted or drank a half a bottle of whiskey. I didn't do that either because I was so used to not drinking. Inability to concentrate. So what I did was rather than like I'm a great multitasker, what I did was I focused on one thing and one thing only. So for instance, here's an example. You do your laundry and after you take the clothes out of the dryer, you dump your clothes on the bed, right? And a lot of people would just pick through their clothes and and pick them as they need them. I made sure that if I took clothes out of the dryer, <clears throat> dumped them on the bed, that I was going to, that I was literally going to finish folding all those clothes because I had such a lack of concentration, I wasn't even able some days to finish folding my clothes. And I would just like throw them on the floor and then pick underwear off the floor and go, okay, I didn't wear this. This is the underwear that I'll wear today. It got to the point, and then when I went to bed at night, just like throw my clothes on. It got to the point where I couldn't even tell which clothes were the dirty ones, which ones were the clean ones. So a big accomplishment, what's a big accomplishment? Let's, let's talk about what are big accomplishments. Losing 50 to 100 pounds, getting a master's degree, getting a PhD, getting a first home mortgage. Think about that, right? Those are big accomplishments. When you are going through a breakup or a divorce, you know what a big accomplishment is? Doing your laundry, getting a good shave in, folding your clothes cooking a meal for yourself. It gets down to as basic as simple items of self-care when you're going through a breakup or divorce. Make your bed, exactly. Fear. Fear. What can we do about fear? Uh, Fear is one of those things I heard uh, one person say many years ago, fear is false expectations appearing real. And I've always said that action cures fear. The biggest way to, to defeat fear in your life is action, massive action. Action cures fear. That's all I can say about it. Action cures fear. There's no pill in the world. There's no drink in the world. There is no beautiful body in the world. There's no sexual experience in the world that can cure you from fear. Action cures fear. Increased web usage. Set a timer. Let's go back to that timer thing. If you're on the web, just on social media, if you literally have to set a physical timer, turn it to 30 minutes or 60 minutes, when that alarm goes off, you turn off the laptop. You step away from the computer. Same thing with television. No falling asleep in front of the TV on the, on the sofa. No, 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 no. You sleep in your bed. You turn the TV off in your rec room, your living room, wherever you watch television, and you go in your room. Now, I know some people that have to have their TV on in order to go to sleep. That would drive me nuts. Learn to sleep without, without noise. People who need noise, who need that sensory experience, are telling me unconsciously that they're not done grieving yet because they're trying to fill the quietness of their house. They're trying to replace the noise that used to be there with the spouse or the girlfriend or the boyfriend that left. 
and they can't stand the quiet. So if that means you have to have one hour of quiet time in your house with no TV, no radio, no nothing, then do it. And do that for an hour a day for a week. The next week, you might do two hours a day. It takes time. I'm kind of a, a, what you would call, for me, I learn by immersion, which means I have to do it all at once. So I don't gradually build things up. I just do it. And I found that works for me. And everybody has their own learning style. Eyes tired and strained. What can you do about it? One of the first things you can do is get sleep, which is difficult if you're not sleeping. That's very difficult. But your self-care system, I know you're going to have bags under your eyes. You're going to have dark circles under your eyes. Your eyes are going to be tired. Do you ever notice that when your eyes are tired, when your eyes are tired, you feel tired. Something about just that little, these, these two circles right here, if these don't feel good, then we are tired. So one of the things that I do is um, I was I work in the shower because I have a tendency to have dark circles. So I work the, I work the eyes in the shower. Literally, I will take soap in my hands, and I take um, my ring finger because I you don't want to be like jamming your fingers and and that's very thin skin. This is good for men and women, and I massage lightly to the to my temples like this. And what that does is that decreases the fluid buildup that's in your eyes. But there's a three-step process here. Step number two, massage to the side and then massage down, down. Because what you're doing is you're draining, you're draining that fluid through ducts and you want it to go down. There's ducts that go down, okay? Massage down, it goes into the lymph area. Now here's what you do. If you really want to get rid of your puffy eyes, massage to the temples, massage down, and then under the neck, go all the way to the collarbone. And what you're doing is you're pushing that fluid down. You're helping it drain. If you don't drain those ducts, then you end up with puffy, tired eyes all the time. Another thing that I did, and you're going to think this is weird, it's, it's a, for lack of a better term, a beauty secret that many people do. Take two spoons and put two spoons in the freezer. Literally, two spoons. And then you put the spoons on your eyes. And God, it feels good. And then just put them back in the freezer. That relieves the tired eyes, the eye strain. If you cannot look so worn and so tired, you'll actually feel better. Because I know every time you pass by a mirror, you might say, my God, I look like shit. If you can look good, if you can look as good as you possibly can in your grieving time. And here's something for those that have been through this a while ago. Look back at when I look back at pictures of when I was going through my divorce or at post divorce and breakup. I'm talking, you know, like I said, almost two decades ago. When I look back at pictures of myself, I didn't seem like myself. It, I don't recognize me. I recognize me now. This is me. This is who I am. I feel comfortable being me. And I was going through a new phase of, of grief and a- ambiguity about reinventing myself. I felt like I looked worse. Yeah, I looked worse. Yeah. So there we go. There's part two of the 50 things you will feel after a breakup and what you can do about it next week. I want you to uh, tune in again. We'll do it again next week. I'll be announcing it on all across all of my social media platforms. We will. We went up to uh, number twenty-one tonight. 
we still have a lot more to go next week. Uh, I'm going to cover things like shallow breathing, an uncertain future, your swagger is gone, you're antisocial, you're isolated, and you choose isolation, missing the warmth of another body. Got a lot of stuff to talk about next week. I hope you enjoyed this tonight. I hope it helped somebody tonight. I know uh, this can be an ongoing series that I repeat every, you know, it's a four-part series. Uh Maybe I can repeat it every month because there's always somebody going through a breakup. So I just want to say thank you for joining tonight. Uh, remember this. Uh, you are alive. You are alive. You will survive. Oh, thank you for the super chat, Tarek. I appreciate that. You are alive and you will survive. And this is in my series called Surviving and Thriving after a breakup. It's not just a matter of surviving. You want to get back, not to what your old, people say, I just want to get back to my old self. You don't want to get back to your old self. What you want to do is be better than your own self. And I can't think of a better platform. Now you've got the time to do that, to be a better version of yourself. And you don't do it to get your ex back. You don't do that. I, I know some people are thinking, you know, well, um, success is the best form of revenge. Get that out of your head. I know there's a certain point where you just want to have revenge and make things right. Uh, I would say loosen the grip on that and just let it go. Do not get caught up. If you're a man, don't get caught up in red pill, manosphere, MGTOW, and all this kind of stuff. Don't, don't get caught up in that. They are nice places to visit, but you don't want to live there. Okay. Life is dynamic. It's not a static event. You have to deal with people. And I want to be the voice of clarity, sanity, and reason in the men's world and also with ladies too. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining. Hang in there, man. Hang in there. I'll see you soon. Thank you.